13, 2009, regular monthly meeting of the Cape Elizabeth Town Council. Um, I will read the roll call. Uh, Chairman Rowe here. Councillor Backer. Present. Councillor Jordan. Here. Councillor Lennon. Here. Councillor McKenney. Councillor Sherman. Here. And Councillor Swift Gadda. Here. Thank you. Uh, please rise and join me for a pledge of allegiance to our flag. Because our uh, clerk is on vacation, uh, we did not have extra copies of the agenda printed uh, left at the back of the room. And because of that, I will write, read down quickly the items that are on tonight's agenda so that you might uh, have an idea of what's in store. Item number 110-2009, uh, Administrative Code. Item 113-2009, The Goddard Mansion. Item 114-2009, Report on Workshop on the Town Center Intersection. Item 115-2009, Appointments Committee Report. Item 116-2009, Financial Update and Carry Forward Balances. Uh, item 117-2009, Proposed Municipal Operations Review Committee. Um, and item number 118, 2009, will be held in executive session. It is a request for a property tax abatement. Town Council uh, reports and correspondence. Uh, I have a couple items here. Uh, I'm pleased to report that we have recently staffed uh, two ad hoc committees, two new ad hoc committees in town. Uh, the first is the Employee Health Insurance Review Committee. Uh, staff advisors for that committee are Matt Sturgis and Paulina Portria. Town Council member our representative will be Penny Jordan. School Board Representative will be Mary Townsend, and Citizens at Large will be Al Barthelman, Jim Walsh, Beth Richardson, Kyle Parrish, and David Hillman. Also, uh, we have filled the Town Center Intersection Evaluation Committee, which is charged with evaluating the, the uh, passive measures that we've undertaken at the intersection and re recommending uh, improvements, if, there, if any. Uh, that, member, that committee is made up of Town Councilor Sarah Lennon, School Board Member Mary Townsend, and Citizens Cynthia Dill and Tom Kinley. Uh, both of these committees will be beginning their work uh, very shortly, and we'd like to thank not just these folks, but all, again, all of our citizen committees for doing the work of the town. It's uh, greatly appreciated. Uh, on June 15th, the manager and I joined nearly 140 uh, others, many of who are local and county government officials in the Peter J. Feeney Charity Golf Tournament. Uh, Peter was a young and vibrant Cumberland County Commissioner uh, whose life was tragically cut short about 10 years ago. His seat on the commission uh, is currently held by his father, Dick Feeney, and each year since his death, uh, Dick Feeney has sponsored this tournament, which uh, raises proceeds for local charities. Uh, Mike and I played with Standish Town Manager and new president of G GP Cog, Gordy Billington, and his wife, the weather was similar to that uh, that was at the U.S. Open, that is wet. <laughs> Golf was not similar to that that was at the U.S. Open. <laughs> but it was for a very worthwhile cause nevertheless, and, we, and uh, the good news is we did not come in last. Uh, on, Close. <laughs> <laughs> Close. <laughs> on June 26th, we celebrated the official opening of another stretch of the uh, trail along the shores of Great Pond. This was the result of a partnership between the Cape Elizabeth Land Trust and the town in acquiring conservation easement rights from the Jody Jordan family. Also key in the clearing of the section of trail were the Conservation Commission members, uh, Mike Duddy in particular. This year's graduating eighth grade class at the middle school uh, who chose this project uh, for their public service project. Two recently graduated Cape Elizabeth High School students who selected this as their senior transition product, pro project and also our Public Works Department. So another win for public access at Great Pond. Also on uh, June 27th, the following day, I was invited to attend the field day of the Portland Amateur Wireless Association down at Fort Williams. Uh, a former school classmate of mine, Bryce Romery, is current president of that group. Aside from being uh, avid hobbyists, hobbyists in the uh, radio field, 
This group serves as the emergency backup for our county emergency uh, communications. And it was a very interesting day. They, I had a tour of their uh, transmission and receiving facility that they'd, uh, it was a mobile facility that they'd set up at the fort. Uh, their task for the weekend was to contact as many different ham operators around the world as they could in 24 hours. So it was, it was kind of an inter interesting undertaking to watch, but a great day, and a, and a day without rain, too. I have Penny? something. Um, I just wanted to let people know that uh, the first annual Cape Farm Alliance Strawberry Fest, uh, we had a little gap in the 30 days and 30 nights of rain. So on the 26th and 27th of June, we had well over 3,000 people who showed up at the uh, first annual Strawberry Fest. It was a huge success. And all of the farms, whether it be the uh, horse farms or the strawberry farms, all had many people attending the various events. And so we are proud to say that this will be uh, an ongoing event for Cape Elizabeth over um, hopefully the next hundred years so uh, for the foreseeable future so thank you to everybody in Cape Elizabeth who attended and helped make this very successful thanks Penny and congratulations yeah it was awesome other uh, town council reports and correspondence Seeing none, uh, we have our first opportunity for citizens uh, to discuss items that are not on tonight's agenda. Hopefully you remembered all those items that I read uh, so you will know what items are on the agenda, but we offer citizens their first chance to speak to items that are not on tonight's agenda. If you could please uh, approach the podium. Thank you. Thank you. We're going to take the next six months and educate you about health insurance. On the first page of the pass out that I gave you, you see a graph. On that graph, there are a bunch of boxes that go down. That's the out of pocket expenses for employees. As the out of pocket expenses for employees go down, the premiums go up. And if you look at that, it's a perfect X. And the interesting part about that is when I bought my first car in 1967, a Ford Mustang, it cost $2,100. When I bought my Impala in 2007, it cost $21,000. In 1970, when I entered the insurance business, the out of pocket cost was $100, deductible. If you use the same numbers as I use in the car, the out of pocket cost should be at least $1,000. So the out-of-pocket cost for the school system, which I believe is true, which is the deductible is now $300, has not gone up with, with medical inflation. It's actually gone down, and the premiums have gone up. Second chart. This was an amazing figure that I, I ran through. The insurance companies all love to tell you, you're going to be sick this year. The reality is 80% of the people incur 20% of the claims. 20% of the people then incur 80% of the claims. But the interesting number is 5% of the people incur 50% of those claims. In fact, and I can't document this, and for those who can't read my charts, I have this all documented as to where my sources are, so I'm not just speaking off the top of my head. In fact, the one thing I can't document, which is a fact that I read a while back, a while back being about five years ago, 70% of the money which each of you will spend during your lifetime on medical care is spent on your deathbed. If you want to cure the Medicare problem, very simple. Let people die. It is that simple. But if that's the case, then that means that most of the employees in Cape Elizabeth will not be incurring large medical expenses. Those will be incurred on their deathbed. And this is why, really, the federal government doesn't want to get involved in this thing. Go to the last page. I have a three-minute time limit, so that's why I'm going quick. The last page is a quote that I did in March 
of this year for a 17 life case, 17 employees. The total premium was $100,000. They had a very low deductible, it was zero. And you can see, and I, I, I wrote in my own handwriting, if you raise the deductible, the premiums came down. If you went from 1,000 to 500, the premium went down a staggering 3%. If you went from 500 to 1,000, the premium came down 10%. If you went from 1,000 to within a higher co-insurance, the premium came down 15%. If you went to a $2,500 deductible, the premium came down 32%. Now, the way the CAPE is writing their insurance today is they're saying, okay, let's ignore the fact that 80% of the people are healthy and 20% are sick. Let's cover all the people as though they're going to be sick. And the question is, how do we pick out uh, this group of, of uh, 17 people, 5% times 17 is one person. How do we pick out that one claim that's going to be the bad claim and make sure that person doesn't get hurt? I'd love to answer that question, but I haven't got time. We'll start going to that more next, uh, next month. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Fred. Other citizens who would like to speak to items that are not on tonight's agenda? Seeing none. Um, we have the town manager's report. Yes, uh, thank you, Jim. I wanted to update you actually on, on five things this, this evening. First of all, I wanted to mention Family Fun Day. Uh, for those, I, I think David Sherman was there, I'm not sure others. I, I've been to a number of Family Fun Days uh, over the years. I think they started in 1982. And by far, it seemed to be the most successful Family Fun Day uh, during the day in terms of the folks there. There, were cons there was concern that the fireworks might, uh, not having fireworks might bring the crowd down. Uh, in fact, they all seemed, the ones that usually came at night all seemed to come during the day. Every report was that the not-for-profit organizations who were there uh, made more money than they ever did in the past. And there was just this great, great sense of community at this event. And, you know, I feel bad, you know, that we make many tough budget decisions. And, you know, I'm, I'm really appreciative that the Family Fund Day Committee put together Family Fund Day and that they spread their appropriation out so that there'll be more than enough money to do a family fund day next year as well by not spending their full appropriation this year. So it's, uh, they just did a great job and the, the, the community tremendously supported family fund day. And I think it's, it's really worthy of note. Secondly, uh, on July 1, we went to the, the transition of consolidating dispatching in with the city of Portland. Uh, First, I want to thank the Chief of Police for all of his work. It, it wasn't easy uh, in dealing uh, with the City of Portland and dealing with uh, a number of other issues. Portland was very cooperative, but at the same time, you know, there's the culture of dealing with a totally different organization from what you're dealing with, uh, you know, it is a bit of a challenge, but uh, everything seems to be going very well. Uh, there, there was an initial problem with some telephone lines with, with transfer calls, not, not emergency calls. Uh, but we were having those same problems on our phone lines. It had nothing to do directly with the consolidation. It was just uh, our phone service provider, One Communication, was having network problems that people looked at. It must be a problem with Cape. It had nothing to do with Cape Elizabeth at all. But all the emergency calls were going through, and the chief stepped in and made sure all calls go directly so there weren't any transfers and immediately addressed the issue. I've spoken with a number of police officers on how this is working. And, uh, you know, they, they miss their dispatcher friends, but they say how great it is that they're now in the police cruiser and for the first time they have laptops uh, in the cruiser. So they not only know, uh, they have the GPS, they know where the other police cruiser on duty is in Cape Elizabeth at all times if they need assistance. They also know where all of the South Portland police cruisers are. So if they need mutual aid, they can now communicate directly car to car uh, with each other without it going out over the air. And, you know, it's just amazing the evolution of technology uh, that has come about. And a lot of that was paid for uh, through, uh, through the ability of a grant that we received actually a couple of years ago that took, took the time to be spent, uh, took, took time to be spent awaiting this changeover. But, you know, there's always, there's probably going to be a few hiccups along the way. Uh, but, you know, in the, you know, there's a few people they don't like this little wording or that little wording of things differently. But, you know, it, if you look at the numbers, you know, the original uh, savings is $132,000. And, you know, we've looked at the numbers. I shared an email with the council 
the other day looking at you know how much the transition cost uh, it was about twenty thousand dollars that we incurred for odds and ends of expenses a new fire alarm cable going to South Portland some computer work uh, but about twenty thousand in local out-of-pocket expense we, we also paid out uh, severance to the four dispatchers uh, who left as a result of them being in, involuntarily uh, terminated. Uh, for their 83 years of service, that was around $30,000. The numbers are here somewhere in my notes, but uh, uh, I don't have them right in front of me, but it was uh, about $30,000. Uh, you know, overall, we also paid, as we would, vacation, sick leave accruals for any employee leaving. Uh, but you know, most of you know, the dispatchers have all been uh, uh, very, very friendly, very helpful. Penny, Jim, and myself attended on June 30th, I believe it was, June 29th, a party down at Joe's Boathouse, which the town co-sponsored along with the Cape Elizabeth Police uh, Union, the Police Benevolent Association. And it was unfortunately one of the dispatchers got forced to work that night here in Cape Elizabeth because of a whole bunch of different reasons. Uh, but the two that were there had a good time, and uh, of the four dispatchers that we employed, uh, one of them has accepted a position with the town of Scarborough. Uh, one of them hasn't decided what he wants to do, but he, he accepted his severance. In fact, the, I was over there when he transitioned out, and he even called me and called, made a couple of other calls after he got home that day, just saying how appreciative he was of the way, the way things were handled. Uh, a, the third dispatcher, Ed Hunt, is, has accepted the position uh, working Monday through Friday over at the, at the dispatch, uh, the former dispatch center, the new clerical position that was established. And the fourth dispatcher is, we believe, will be settled into a new position rather soon. Uh, I don't want to go into some personal details, but things look, look very good. So, but as a result, we were worried about this displacement procedures in the contract, in the contracts and the personnel policy. There have been no displacements of uh, of, of employees uh, as a result of that changeover. Uh, you know, it, it, it has really gone well. All the other things we said would get done, we've gotten done. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's still a few people that would like to see it the old way. Uh, but overall, I think it, it just went uh, as good as it could. Uh, thirdly, I do want to mention uh, street lights are continuing to be removed by Central Main Power. You may have seen some of the trucks around town. Uh, just a reminder that as a result of one of the changes in the budget, there's 125 street lights that are being removed. Uh, if you go online uh, to, the web, to the town website, you type in the search box, street lights. The, there was an article in the news archive uh, about a, two months ago that listed all the street lights to be removed. You can see them, but they're continuing to make progress. We, the chief of police is receiving some calls and particularly from those that live within a house of where the lights are being removed. Uh, you tend, if, you, if there was a light five houses away, we're not getting those calls. Uh, we're getting the calls from the folks that happen to have the lights <coughs> right in front of their homes. It, as we expected, it's not popular with everyone. Uh, that change, but the chief has said anyone has concerns should give them a call. And uh, he's recording all of the concerns. He's going to be evaluating them over the course of the summer. And, and in fact, the program does remove a few more lights that need to be removed under the budget decision, just in case there were a few lights that need to go back in as a result of further, further discussion and deliberation. Any questions on those three issues now? I've got two more. No? Uh, there's been a lot of talk about Rudy's and its closing time uh, and the interpretation of, of different council actions and the interpretation of the code enforcement officer. I, I want to to explain to the council and to anyone who's, out, else who's interested exactly what the decision of the code enforcement officer has been and how it relates to the, the different ordinances. Uh, one of the changes in the BA zoning that was adopted defined the closing time uh, for, for Rudy's and for similarly situated businesses that, that, that serve alcohol. It's, it, the new ordinance that went into effect July 8th defines closing time as customer, essentially customers out of the building. Uh, no more, obviously no more service, customers out of the building. It doesn't control how long people are in the parking lot, it just controls customers out of the building. Uh, the 
part of the vote of the town council was to allow Rudy's to be open till 10 o'clock if they wanted to be open. Uh, that was for when I say Rudy's, I'm talking about that particular BA zone within so many feet of a of, of residential neighborhood. And some have questioned, you know, why, why the code enforcement officer has determined that, it, that they need to get site plan approval in order to stay open until 10 o'clock. And I asked Bruce today, Bruce specifically, Bruce Smith, the code enforcement officer, show me exactly where in the ordinance this requirement is. I'd like to point out two provisions. One, and this is the pre-existing ordinance. None of this was changed. 19.9-2 applicability, activities requiring site plan review, <laughs> paragraph 2. Any non-residential expansion or change in use, except that changes of use within the town center district, shall be governed by the provisions of section 1964E site plan review. So any expansion or change of use, except in the town center zone. Then you go to the definitions in the ordinance, and it defines expansion of use, the same terminology, the addition of weeks or months to a use's operating season, comma, additional hours of operation, comma, or the use of more floor area, ground area, or volume devoted to a particular use. So the, the reason Rudy's is being required to close at 9 and not at 10 and requires site plan approval is because the, the applicability of the ordinance says you, that you need to have site plan approval if there's a, an expansion or change in use. And expansion of use is defined, among other things, as additional hours of operation. Uh, th there, was a, there was emails going around that said Rudy's have been fined because of you know, some violation of closing time. That's not true. Uh, we don't know where that came from. Uh, it's just not true. I think the council received an email to that effect and wanted to clarify that. Any questions on that? Yeah. Yeah. What, um, so say Rudy's or whoever did want to stay open until 10 o'clock as would be permitted in that zone, a maximum of 10 o'clock as would be permitted in that zone. Um, how, tell me about site plan review. What do they have to do? S site plan review, there's a, there's a whole set of criteria that one needs to go through site plan review. Any site plan review comes before the planning board. Applications need to be prepared. The, the planning board does go through a checklist. They can waive certain requirements uh, or not waive certain requirements. In the issue particularly of Rudy's, it's my recollection and understanding that they had already prepared a site plan review application uh, about a year and a half ago before some of the issues came up involving the shoreline setback issues, which the council addressed. So most of those issues are ready. The, 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 the real challenge with, with Rudy's and the site plan review is that if you look at the, the standards, there's a real desire to remove the parking lot right, the parking right in front that backs out onto Route 77, you know, in favor of using the parking lot next to the building. Uh, the, the site plan proposal that they paid to have developed by their consulting engineer, architect, whoever it was, you know, did, did address those issues. So, you know, Rudy's is welcome to apply for site plan review, but there is a checklist that they need to go through that includes everything confirming property boundaries and, uh, you know, submitting the, what the design would be, the landscaping, in conformance with the current ordinance. So if I could ask another question. So when someone applies for site plan review, can they apply for that review just to apply to their hours? Or, is, or does it mean that everything about the business has to be reviewed in some way? The, the standing I mean, do you practice. apply for an expansion, if you're applying for an expansion of use, in other words, another hour? The standing practice is when you apply for site plan review, everything is on the table. Okay. I, I, I will note that I personally, when I was thinking about voting for this, it was my understanding that Rudy's would be able to stay open for a hard closing at 10 o'clock, meaning everybody out at 10 o'clock as opposed to the soft closing at 9 o'clock, which is what was sort of happening before. So this was a surprise to me. I understand that the code enforcement officer is not under the control of the town council. He is independent, 
is an independent statutory officer, but I, I would note that this was sort of a surprise to me. David? Um, actually, it, it wasn't a surprise to me, but I understand why some of us were surprised. I think I said at least once in the final hearing that if Rudy's wanted to stay open until 10 o'clock, they'd have to come in for site plan review. I was hopefully, uh, I was very hopeful that that would happen, that we would see some uh, substantial improvements to that business. And I was also always under the impression that Mary Page was planning to come in for site plan review. I guess what I was surprised about, though, was that the, the unintended consequence of our, of our hard definition for a closing time meant that 9 o'clock, everyone's out of the building. And I honestly did not anticipate that result. Um, and, but so, Mike, I have a question for you, which is the 9 o'clock closing time that somehow Bruce Smith settled upon, was that based on the, the historical practice of the businesses in that location? And therefore, Rudy's was essentially grandfathered to be able to stay open till 9 o'clock. And under the old definition, 9 o'clock was a soft closing time, which then allowed you know, 15, 20 minutes for people to leave the building. Um, was the 9 o'clock some sort of grandfathered uh, uh, time? Sure, you, Mr. Chairman. It, it was documented that that was, the, a tr that that was a traditional closing time. Okay. Other questions? Comments? One more. The, the final one. Uh, I just want to mention, you know, there's so much push, pulling and tugging and so many issues these days. And I just want to relate, I had some friends visiting this weekend from uh, New Jersey and Pennsylvania and even uh, there, was, there was some folks actually from all over the Northeast. And it, it, it was in conjunction with the visit, a visit from the President of Rotary International uh, who was here this weekend. And, but anyway, you, all the friends I drove around town what, said what a beautiful town. They, that was the first comment, how beautiful it is. They went to Fort Williams Park. They were amazed at the number of people using a public park. They had never seen so many people using, particularly a small public park, and such a concentration of people for just being there and walking around and, and enjoying the event. They noted all of the people out walking and jogging all over town in, in so many different places. They looked at the landscaping of some of our, our public facilities and buildings and, and commented on that. I, the, the community garden took them over to see that, tremendously imp impressed by that. And it just, you know, we look, read these emails today, and every one of them is so negative. Not everyone. Almost all of them are so negative. And you know, it's nice to bring some people in who have the more of the, 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 the broader look and to see, you know, just how lucky we have uh, to have so many great things in Cape Elizabeth. And I, uh, I just want to say, I, you know, people can, you know, I encourage emails on many different topics and disagree with, but it's still nice to, to uh, it, it was very good to, to see so many people enjoying Cape Elizabeth and, you know, the residents who were out jogging and running and doing all the things they were, as well as uh, so many. They ran into uh, someone in the audience at the, the Puda Club. And, you know, again, everyone was saying what a tremendous facility this clubhouse is. And then when they understood that it was, you know, had just opened as a result of, you know, a private club decided to make that investment, you know, that again says an awful lot, you know, the, about the Puda Club and, you know, just what a great asset that is for the, for the members of it and the, uh, the use they, they give to the community for, for different events there. So I just wanted to say something positive and uh, uh, we need more bright, sunny weekends. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Ditto that. Although the new clubhouse at Raputic has not improved my game one stroke. <laughs> um, review of minutes uh, of the meeting held June 8, 2009. Moved to accept. Second. Moved and seconded. Uh, discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor? The 6 0. Thank you. Item number 110 2009, Administrative Code. Uh, this item was postponed uh, from June 8, 2009 to June 13, 2009. Uh, my recollection is that it was postponed and not tabled, so I don't think we need a motion to. Uh, to bring it off the table, right? Uh, Mike, would you like to give some yes, background to this? Yes, the council uh, reviewed this uh, back at your last meeting. You subsequently had a workshop. 
You had encouraged me to make some changes, uh, made those changes, and the document that's now before you uh, reflects uh, the changes the Council uh, implied that it might like to see in a, in a revised draft. Thank you. Do I have a motion, uh, David? I would move that we adopt the uh, administrative code as amended and presented to us by the town manager. Second. second. Moved and seconded. Discussion on the motion. Seeing none, all in favor of the motion. 6 0. Thank you. Item number 113 2009, Goddard Mansion. Um, we held a workshop in June uh, at which the Fort Williams Advisory Commission uh, submitted its uh, findings regarding the Goddard Mansion. Um, they gave us a report and recommendations. Um, it's been recommended that we set a public hearing on this topic for Monday, September 14th, 2009 at 7.30 p.m. Do I have a motion? So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. Discussion on the motion. Seeing none, all in favor? Unanimous, thank you. Item number 114-2009, uh, report on a workshop on the town center intersection. Um, I will do my best to, to give that report. Um, we did meet at 6.30 this evening prior to this meeting. Uh, we welcomed John Duncan from PACS, uh, Kat Fuller, who is the chief planner at the MDOT, Maine Department of Transportation, and also Sean Smith, who has been the project manager for the proposed uh, uh, intersection uh, improvements. Um, the workshop began with, with Mr. Smith giving us a history of, of the project. Um, Going all the way back, actually, to 1993 and 2003, uh, studies were, which were referenced back then, um, and funding actually was uh, budgeted at that point to be $250,000 for a similar project at the intersection. Um, the immediate history for this project uh, began in 2004, before many of us on the council were even on the council. Um, but over the course of the last three or four years, five years actually, uh, there have been public hearings, public forums, uh, design workshops. Um, I did have the benefit of attending the, the uh, design workshop uh, a couple of years ago and uh, several, I think there were three designs that were discussed at that. It was a roundabout uh, and also the signal that wound up being the, the uh, design that has moved forward. Um, we jumped ahead. Uh, we had a budget figure for the proposed project, the signal project, uh, given to us of $1.1 million, of which uh, approximately $363,500 was to be state and federal funded, and the balance of $736,400 uh, would be locally funded. Um, we, uh, you may recall that the item was brought up a year ago, uh, November, uh, for discussion. We decided to table it at that point until this past May. Um, and again in May, we decided to table until this coming November uh, in order to give passive measures a chance uh, to prove themselves. Uh, you can't have gone through the intersection without having noticed the stanchions, the signs, the, the uh, accentuated crosswalk the crossing flags and so forth. Um, the whole uh, thinking behind tabling was to give these, chance, these things a chance to, uh, to prove themselves. Uh, in the interim though, however, we have been contacted by the MDOT, the Department of Transportation and PACS. Uh, they would like Cape Elizabeth to come up with a firm decision, yay or nay, before November. The reason is that they have this money hanging out there and it's not doing anything. Uh, there are projects in line to be serviced and um, it, it, makes it, it puts them in a difficult spot to have money sitting on Cape Elizabeth's project and not being used. Uh, they would like an answer sooner than November. Um, just for an example, um, every two years the, uh, PACS is, uh, uh, gives uh, grants on biennial uh, schedule, there are typically 10 intersection applications. 
They have a scoring system which they put these applications through, and typically two or three are funded every two years. And this intersection was one of the ones that was funded back in 2004, right? Uh, I believe. Uh, usually when, when funding is offered, uh, there's a 10-year window that applies. In other words, from the time you apply for the money and it's granted, there's a 10-year window to get the, the uh, project to completion. So this is a departure from the normal procedure. They want an answer sooner. Um, so uh, the council met with these folks tonight, asked several uh, very good questions, I thought. Uh, we reiterated some of the questions that have been asked to us in emails, uh, namely uh, some of the concerns about uh, the, the limited amount of time in a day that a traffic control was actually needed there. Um, some citizens have mentioned and cite articles that traffic lights like the one proposed actually cause more accidents than they prevent. Uh, we asked the, the uh, traffic engineer to comment on these. He provided some indication, but he wasn't really uh, able to provide concrete answers, and, and understandably so, I think, because there are so many variables that go into these projects. Uh, so the, the questions proceeded. Uh, ultimately, we discovered that there were three questions, or, or two questions primarily, that we needed answers to before we as a town council can make a, an informed decision, yay or nay. And one of those is the town's fiscal exposure were we to abandon the project at this point. Uh, we had been provided with two answers in the past. Uh, one of them amounted to an exposure of about $30,000. And the other answer that we got amounted to an exposure of about $130,000, quite a difference. And we were not able to get a firm answer tonight. Um, what is it if we abandon the project? Are we, are we on, the, on the line for $30,000 or $130,000? Um, CATFO, the chief planner at MDOT, had promised, has promised to take this issue uh, to the executive management team uh, the day after tomorrow, Wednesday, they meet and will hopefully have an answer for us uh, by the end of the week. Also, we, we questioned how much of the money that was bonded by the town back in 2004 um, is, is available for this project. We have used some of the money for, for other town center projects, but uh, we need to know how much money is left in that uh, bond for this project. So without those answers, uh, we're not yet able to, to act on this item tonight. Um, so the last item of the workshop was to hopefully find a date and time where we could uh, further discuss this and hopefully uh, arrive at a conclusion. Um, and we weren't able to do that even, but we will have a meeting, whether it will be at our August regular town council meeting or at a meeting specially called at some point in August. We hope to have a, a decision sometime during the month of August. Um, I think that is all I had written down for notes. Uh, there were several, as I say, very specific questions, good questions. I didn't mark them all down, but uh, I, I did want to uh, share the, the outcome of that workshop with the citizens tonight. Uh, would other counselors like to add to my comments? OK. Um, so that was the item, is just a report on the workshop. And I can assure citizens. Uh, and the public comment? Uh, we have a provision in the, in the council rules that you may comment on items that are on the agenda. We, we usually ask that you, that you speak to me first, but we didn't have an agenda out. So what would you like to say, Fred? Come on up and, and to the podium. Fred Prince, 2 Rocky Hill Road, once again. Uh, I'm unique. I can't turn my neck. So I have to do things differently than a lot of other people uh, do. I cannot get onto 77 from Scott Dyer. But I can get onto 77 from Hill. So what's the answer to your problem? If two streets coming onto 77 and 77 go through, block off the entrance on Scott Dyer to 77 and put that traffic down to Hill. They will see wide open as far as the traffic's coming. You cut down the, uh, the, the problem with that is the, is the offset. 
and that's where you can't see the traffic coming. You block that off, they can't come in, there's no problem. It's a 200-yard difference, and that's all that it is. So, uh, next point, it is financial. California is broke, they're issuing IOUs. Fifth largest economy in the world. It's not even being reported, I can't believe it. This country, the dollar is tanking. For our town, of the state, let's, let's go back to the school board. The school board said we expected to get 30 or 100 or $200,000 from the state. The state's broke. The state just had an article in the Press Herald. They're down $100 million in income. Hello? Of course you are. It's going to be even worse as time goes on. For this town or any town to be looking at spending more money is crazy. I applaud Mike for his efforts in turning off, off, off a light bulb. You don't turn off light bulbs and put another one up. And also, Mike, you wonder why people don't join, don't join committees. As I recall, three years ago, we had a committee that said that the overall view of this, the overall uh, 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 feature of this town should be, it should be a rural community. Well, I'd like you to drive me through any rural community that has two stoplights within 400 yards of each other. That's not rural, that's urban. And that goes against that committee. So why waste all that time being on a committee to have a long-range plan that doesn't even last more than three years? That's not long-range. And the reason why your people liked what they saw when they came here is because the fort was free. We did that. And two, there were no stoplights, and it was green open areas. I came from Wellesley, Massachusetts, and it used to be like Cape Elizabeth. It is no more, because every, every darn time they turned around, there was another stoplight. And then another stoplight, and another stoplight. And before you know it, there goes a the rural, and in comes the urban. That's not what we came here for. That's not what we want. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Fred. Sir. My name is James Tassie. I live at 30 Cliff Avenue in Cape Elizabeth. Um, and I think that the discussion tonight has illustrated that Cape Elizabeth is experiencing some changes. The improvements in the dispatch and police communications, the situation with Rudy's, both indicate that Cape Elizabeth is experiencing a period of growth and is transitioning from what may have been a completely rural community, you know, even as recently as 25 years ago, to something that really is a little bit more suburban in character. Shore Road, for example, is considered a urban collector street. Um, it is not classified as a rural road. Um, these changes speak to the maturation of the town and illustrate that growth is essentially inevitable. Even in this time of economic downturn, Cape Elizabeth and the Portland region is still experiencing some growth and some expansion. If growth is inevitable, the question should be, do you plan for it, anticipate it, and take provisions to manage it sensibly, or do you react to it after the fact? I believe that Cape Elizabeth should take steps now to anticipate growth and to plan for it. And I think that a signalized light at Shore Road in 77 and better sidewalks and pedestrian infrastructure throughout, I couldn't help but think as uh, Mr. McGovern was talking about his visitors seeing people walking and running on the streets of Cape Elizabeth that I, was, I couldn't help but wonder if they were thinking, geez, why are there no sidewalks for these people to walk safely upon? Um, I think that the, the city or the town um, could do more to anticipate growth, and uh, I think that a signalized light and better sidewalk and pet infrastructure throughout the town should be you know, considered now. It's going to be more expensive in the future. This project, for example, has been discussed, as you said, I think since 1993. It hasn't gone away. The demand for it is going to grow over time, not diminish. It's going to be more expensive in five years than it is now. I moved here a few years ago from Vermont and, uh, and actually originally started in Massachusetts myself. Um, and so I've seen rural towns and I know that rural towns do occasionally have a stoplight in the village center because it slows traffic down and it lets that rural center have a kind of community feel. People can walk safely. They know they can get across the street safely. A village center is the place for a red light because it stops traffic and it makes a much more attractive streetscape, a place where people can walk and meet face to face. Um, I don't judge my quality of life purely by how small my property tax bill is. 
I judge my quality of life by how effectively the town that I'm living in can provide me with you know, the things that I need to live my life comfortably, enjoyably. And I think that slowing traffic down occasionally on Route 77 and making it safer for pedestrians and cyclists to get through that intersection is a good idea. Thank you. Thank you, Jim. Uh, okay, uh, go ahead, Tony. Uh, I will caution that we do, part of our council rules uh, allows for this discussion of items on the agenda, but we have a time limit, total time limit of 15 minutes, so that would be five speakers at three minutes each. So oh, okay. Just, uh, uh, Tony Armstrong, 32 Lawson Road. <clears throat> at the last uh, meeting I appeared on this, I think it was late last year, it was a, a, a public hearing, and uh, there was some data uh, thrown around about uh, the number of accidents that have occurred at this intersection. And uh, what I wanted to know is what's happened since then. I, I personally have witnessed, and I don't travel through the intersection that much. When I do travel through it, it is during that crucial time right before the high school opens. But uh, I witnessed one serious accident there one morning, a two-car crash. The whole town regalia was there for that event. Then another morning I was with my daughter and I heard this kind of weird screeching sound and I looked up and uh, uh, there was a semi-trailer headed toward Portland. It was kind of a wet day, it wasn't really raining that hard. And he was literally lock braked sliding through, through the intersection. He was in a straight line fortunately. Uh, so that was potentially for me a, a, a really horrendous accident situation. So my question is, do we have new data since for the last six months of any accidents up there? Was that discussed tonight? Not tonight, but we have discussed it. Uh, there have been a couple, I call them fender benders, in the last six months. Uh, well, I wouldn't call that one that I saw, a fender bender. Uh, and I wouldn't call it semi-trailer. Okay. Uh, my yeah, just, since 1980, we've averaged 3.42 accidents per year uh, at that intersection. It's inevitable that in some years you may have more accidents or fewer accidents. Uh, there's been a couple of them that I'm aware of this year. I, I, don't, have the, I don't have the exact number, but I, I, you know, my view is it's more important to look historically uh, what you've had for accidents unless there's you know, something really changing the character. Oh, yeah, I, I like to look at the long-term trends too, but I just noticed in the last six months there seemed to have been above average as opposed to the previous six months I looked a little bit low, below average. I hope that doesn't mean we're going to keep getting more rain since we've got so much the last month, but... <laughs> right, thank you very much. Thank you, Tony. Okay. Me? Yep. <laughs> Hi, Linda Johnson, 1235 Shore Road. Uh, we also own the buildings on either side of 1235, so three of them are right in the intersection. Um, I appreciate everyone's concern about accidents. We still have never yet heard statistics that would tell us that it's particularly more dangerous at that intersection than any other one I can think of. Uh, yep, there have been more accidents at the high school light than there were there previous to having a light. Um, and I appreciate the gentleman who said we have to look to the future, but right now, this town can barely uh. hang on to infrastructure we have. We're having trouble maintaining our schools, which to me are the number one priority. We're having trouble uh, maintaining our police force, et cetera, et cetera. Are we crazy to think that we should spend a million dollars on a street light that is really not necessary. There are a whole lot of other reasons why I do not want to see that there. Some personal ones because we own the property and from looking at the plan, uh, if you're making a right-hand turn in front of the um, 300 or 500 Ocean House uh, to head toward Portland, when the new uh, two lanes are there to turn both ways, you'd be able to reach out the passenger window and grab the torch of that building. Now you tell me that's safe in any way for anybody. I would say, gee, is the town willing to sign on the dotted line and say every time the porch gets hit uh, or someone's trying to walk through there, there's a near miss, uh, that the town will be responsible for that? 
just some more to think about. I feel like I do this about every two years, have a battle about something. I'm kind of tired of being penalized for having invested in the town center. And I think we have invested in the town center. We play that violin all the time. I don't really see any other investment in the town center as great as ours has been. For heaven's sake, we don't need a stoplight. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Okay, we will move on. Item number 115-2009, appointments committee report. Who will be handling this for the Appointments Committee tonight? Paul is the chair, but I'd be happy to Thank you, Ann. Uh, handle this. Um, it's pretty simple. <laughs> the, the Appointments Committee uh, recommends the appointment of Julia Bassett Schwerin uh, to serve an unexpired term on the Arts Commission, and that term would end uh, December 31st, 2010. And her resume and application was attached. So moved. The second. Move, moved and seconded to approve the, the nomination of the Appointments Committee. Uh, discussion on the motion? Seeing none, all in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. Item 116-2009, financial update and carry forward balances. Uh, Mike, you wanted to give some background on this? Yes, I did. And I, I forget who, but someone asked me to give a financial report as well. So I've prepared that, even though we, Very good. we've lost our audience. Uh, well, I'll do it anyway. Uh, first, I want to briefly go over the carry forward balances and indicate that there was a sheet at your place with some bright red ink. Uh, doesn't mean anything other than uh, there was, I got an email from Peter Gleason, the fire chief today, indicating that they had thought they were going to buy some, some bunker coats and some of those things. This, and it hadn't happened yet, $9,348 is the exact amount in that line for uniforms that's left. There's also some rescue gear that they also, uh, they only spent $115 last year out of an appropriation of about 4300 although we don't specifically carry forward in special funds individual lines. So anyway, this is the list. I won't go over it, uh, you know, unless there's any questions. Down below, though, I do want to mention the bond. Uh, the Spurwink Meeting House, that is the amount that is left from the appropriation of the council. Uh, much of that is obligated, although it is still, you know, if all continues, things are moving along there fine now. If that continues, that, that should, should be fine. The bond miscellaneous, that is the money still left for paving uh, for the high school grounds. Uh, for a bill we haven't yet received for work that was just done on Sawyer Road and uh, Wells Road. A little bit more work still to be done on Sawyer Road. Uh, Greenbelt improvements, that money is specifically a request from the Conservation Commission that they'd given me about six months ago relating to a slight expansion of the parking uh, over at the uh, Winnick Woods area. Uh, it, was, it was a recommendation of, of the Conservation Commission. The school building repair equipment is the amount left in that bond item. Any questions on the carry forwards? Ann has her hand up. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Mike, I just I want to go back to the bond miscellaneous line, the 545,000 line. You said there's money in there still left for the high school paving and for the, there's also included in that is the Sawyer Road paving. Is there anything else? I, do those two the things The $300,000 that was unallocated to anything. Okay. It was, it was held in abeyance. Uh, so you know, those, it was originally so in those, the town center improvement area, but when the, the town council reallocated some of these funds back, whatever month it was, uh, it was 300000 that wasn't specifically reallocated awaiting decisions. So the high school paving and the Sawyer Road paving add up to the 245? Except Appro approximately. We don't, yeah, until you actually do it and know the timing. Yes, yeah. but, but exactly. in terms of what the carry yeah. forward is. And we also, in the, the bond account, we have some money still there that for investment earnings. Okay. Uh, and we also have, you know, answered one of the other questions. Uh, there's the infrastructure improvement fund that was that was established a couple of years ago for town center 
primarily for town center improvements, and there's a little over 100,000 in that account as well. Uh, was that like drainage? That's a separate fund. Side? Oh, that's separate. Okay. That's a separate fund, yeah. And um, I, I might have missed this because I was trying to figure out some numbers. The Spurwink Meeting House, the 384, you think that'll... I think that's a little on the high side. The bid came in. Okay. You know, we're still... How is that work going on the Spurwink? It, we, we had some concerns for a while, but it's, it's going really well now. Good. Yeah. Okay. One other thing I do want to mention, roadway improvements, there's 105,000 that I heard Friday that should have been charged to an accrued line that the auditors put in that I wasn't aware of instead of the roadway improvements account. So I think that's, you know, the auditors will, will handle it, but I think the, I, I do want you to know, I think that's actually 256, 936 plus. It's 105,000 something. It was, it was monies that were, it had to do with the uh, Spurwink Avenue reconstruction project that was done about a year ago. So, so it may and be. And that final money? bill got charged to the 715 instead of to the accrued line. So that amount will likely be 105000 more. It'll be an auditor's adjusting entry. So about 256. 256, 257, yeah. Okay. I don't remember. I know it's 105 something. Pauline told okay. me about it. But I, I don't know. She said, oh, by the way, this is what she. The auditors, they've already begun their work and had pointed that out. Thank you. Uh, those are the carry points. I was also asked to give a financial report. It, you know, for all the, the gloom and doom, again, I hate to keep using that term, you know, we ended the year in, in really good shape. Uh, I, I did some more work today looking at the numbers. For example, in the payroll area, the total general fund budget is $8.8 .8 million last year. Of that, about 3.7 million, or 42 percent, was for payroll and Social Security. That was underspent by $142,000, or 1.6 percent of the entire budget, or 3.8 percent of payroll. The reason that was, you know, you, you, you get a lot of going back, was the town clerk's position was eliminated midway through the year. The police captain, as we all know, had an extended vacancy, and overtime expenses were kept down particularly in the police department. Uh, so there's 142,000 there. You know, we had indicated, you know, back when energy prices were going up, we'd try to find savings in different places. Just five areas, printing and advertising, printing and advertising, we only spent 75% of what was budgeted. Conferences and meetings, 44%. Office equipment, 49%. Miscellaneous supplies, 78%. We saved about $35,000 just in those five areas as a result of, you know, every, all the department heads looking, trying to do the best they can. So just in payroll in those other areas I mentioned, the savings of $177,000 spending under the budgeted level, you know, which, you know, I, th I think says an awful lot about the good work department heads did. We had expected in the budget when the council adopted the, the major, or looked at as a finance committee in March and April, of 2008, we looked at the numbers then and we thought revenues were going to decline by 288,700. If you look at budget to budget, it was, there was a 288,700. If you look at actual to actual, last year versus this year, looking at the numbers today, excluding the FEMA reimbursement, which was a one-time unexpected, revenues declined $281,000. We, we predicted 288,000, they actually declined 281,000. So while other communities were having to scramble during the year to make all sorts of changes, you know, we, our revenues were right on target, plus we had the advantage of, of the FEMA ice storm. So, you know, ex except for the power of being out and a few things, but financially it was a, it was a real bonus. Uh, so, you know, as a result, we're ending the year really in good shape. We're not, we're not wringing our hands like all these other communities. Uh, for the coming year, we've also further downscaled revenues in your adopted budget of $270,000. So, you know, when, when you hear that revenue sharing is being cut, when you hear that excise tax, you know, people aren't buying cars, the town council's budget has prepared for that. It, it's known the cuts have been made, the consolidated dispatching, reducing the facilities manager position, the town clerk's position. Uh, we reduced payroll and benefits overall by 
and you know, I think also important, we still honored contracts. A lot of other communities went and got these, you know, weren't concessions. Concessions. And there was some criticism that, you know, we didn't go out and get concessions. You know, for the most part, these contracts only had a year left on them. You know, sometimes a short term gain for long term cost. You know, it, it, in my view, you know, I think as we look at the end of the fiscal year, where we turned out, where we expected to turn out, and the tough decisions the council made for fiscal year 2010, the town is on extremely good financial footing. When we, we looked at the budget for this coming year, uh, 30 departments, and when I say departments, is you, you budget you know, so much for, if there's 30, roughly 37 areas you, you, you budget, 30 of them are lower than this year. So it wasn't just those few areas I mentioned. There's, there's been, you know, there's been economies of scale, econ excuse me, economies looked at in all these different areas and all these different departments. There were in three, three accounts were unchanged. There were three increases, human services, because of, you know, the neediest need, need help, general assistance, that, that's up 22% in the next year's budget. Elections up 89%, insurance 6% because of some workers' comp issues, and the library's up 1.3%. Library circulation last year was up 14%. So circulation up 14%, increase in spending 1.3%. So you know, I think the point is in, in the budget, you look at all these numbers, and we're, we're in good shape. It, taxes receivable was up by excluding the old Viking property. It was, they, they were only up by $12,000. So folks are paying their taxes. Uh, the, the Viking, uh, I understand the bank's foreclosing on that. We expect uh, to be getting some money fairly soon, so that one will clear away. Uh, but that's good. So you know, I also look at it in the context of, and I'm not opposing this, this the, the next item on the agenda, but I, I, I want to talk a little bit about, you know, there's a sense out there that the town's inefficient. And, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, to me, you look at these numbers of the budgets, you know, you know, we're told we don't foresee things. We, you know, the council foresaw them, and they acted upon them. You look at our full value tax. You, you know, you look at our expense, full value tax rate. We're within one cent of the lowest of eleven surrounding communities. You look at expenditure per capita for municipal service. You take the average of Yarmouth, Scarborough, and Falmouth. We're twenty six percent less for overall municipal spending per capita than those communities, 26% less. You look at general government spending, spending for administration, spending for council salaries, you don't get any, uh, spending for all those different things. Of the 11 towns and cities in the region, we exclude Portland, we don't include them. We have the lowest spending per capita of the 11 communities. Uh, you look at Falmouth, for general government, on a per capita basis, we're spending 26% less. For Scarborough, 50% less on a per capita basis. For Yarmouth, 56% less. Uh, you look at, you know, some say, let's get rid of the fire chief. I hear that. We spend less than half the average per capita for fire and rescue than Yarmouth, Scarborough, Falmouth, and Cumberland. Not the average of those four communities, but each of them, we spend for fire and rescue less than half the average per capita for that. We spend the most on parks and recreation per capita of any of those 11 communities. That's why all these people are out jogging and running. But it's also because we have community services in the pool. Uh, but a lot of that, again, is paid for by revenues. So, you know, it, so as we, we hear about debt and all, all the debt, in the last, in this four year period, when it looks like we're not going to incur any debt, we're reducing municipal debt by 25% in just a four-year period. We're, we've already reduced over 15% of that, and my sense is looking at we're not going to borrow money this coming year or the, probably the year after. So that's, that's about a quarter of the reduction in the principal by 25% of, of our indebtedness. So then you look at, if you're looking for economies, of, you look at, you know, where, is, where do you look at? In my view, you know, since you look at these other numbers, it's being managed by the departments, by the council, and everyone else fairly well. 
You look at health insurance. We, we spent municipal 511,000 last year. The council has set up a committee to study that and to try to have savings. Uh, I mentioned debt service, 1.2 million. That's going down every year. Uh, we look at refuse fees. The council, we look at refuse fees, we paid Equal Maine, 664,000. The council worked on that, adopted the mandatory recycling, funded the recycling ed educator. And you know, my point is, is what people are saying they want done is in fact being done. When people say they want to spend less on administration, the numbers show we're spending less on administration. The places where we're spending more money, parks and recreation, you know, it's, it's being paid for by fees and the, the citizens have shown a priority to that. The other two areas we spend the most amount of money, I, I, I sorted the whole budget. It's police payroll and it's public works payroll. Police payroll, this includes Social Security, overtime, police payroll, is nine, was $991,000. You know, we have two police officers on duty at one time, you know, overnight, weekends. We have a community liaison officer and we have a detective. We, we had the captain work more hours. The police budget, excluding the portion that was transferred to from dispatch to police for the, the new clerical position over there, is actually down from last year. But yet I'm not hearing people want less police coverage. I don't hear that at all. They want the, peop they want the police to respond as first responders. They want that level of service. Public works, you know, I'm also not hearing any less of demand for people responding to drainage issues, uh, as we've gotten in the last few weeks, that they want plowing not to happen as soon as they do. So I just raise all this. One is to try to, you know, accentuate the positive, as I'm trying to do all night, because there's certainly, you know, an awful lot out there. When it rains, uh, it seems to be pouring. Uh, but also to indicate that this committee, while there's always things to be found, I just want to caution everyone that, you know, short of totally reinventing everything, and, you know, are you going to do it with police? Are you going to do it with public works? You've got to do it where the big dollars are, you know, to really, have a, to really have a bite. Short of doing anything, I think you need to be realistic with your expectations from this committee. So that's my financial report and my comment on the next item. Thank you very much, Mike, and, and thank you, and indeed the uh, department heads for their work and, and doing such a great job with the budget. And our finance director would like to speak. Oh, I, well, I just had a question. First of all, Chairman. I, um, I echo Mike's uh, caution that whatever is looked at in this new committee, um, you know, the, I think the low-hanging fruit has already been plucked. Uh, and for my time on the council the past years, I, it's always been clear from the benchmarks report that municipal costs per capita have been the lowest or second from lowest of all the towns in the 11 town area. So um, I just don't want people to think that it's a panacea and that suddenly there's going to be some revolutionary idea. If there's a revolutionary idea, I think it will involve cutting services. So people should just be aware of that. Um, I don't mean the council, I mean people out there watching. I know the council's already aware of that. But I also had a question from Mike on the, one of the attachments to the financial update, and that was the revenue control report. Um, in page two and three, uh, I was just flipping through it, page two and three has fund number 20 on it. And Fund number 20 seems to be school sorts of things, at least some school sorts of things. Is that correct, Mike? I'll let you flip to the right page. It's page two and three of the revenue. What's the page number at the top? Page two and then three. Okay. On the revenue control report for the year. Oh, the revenue the, control report. Yeah, okay. the revenue control report. Yeah, this is the revenue control report for all of the general funds. Yes. Schools. Yes. And uh, fund number 20, could you tell me could, what is defined as fund number 20? It seems to be a lot of grants and things like that for schools. Yeah. Is that correct? Those are the, the funds that you've discussed with the three, Mr. Chairman, sure. that you've discussed with the school board any, in any number of years. The, the, in the, they've referred to as entitlement funds. Yes. They're referred to as categorical funds. 
and it also includes the 421,000 that they received from the stimulus, stimulus. Okay. Uh, from the state that would have been a curtailment. Uh, right. You know, if you look up above there, state revenue subsidy was 421,000 short, but then it shows up down below in Fund 20. Yes, as a I, I understand that. Um, but the thing that I found somewhat startling about this, and I not really focused on it before, was not the amounts that were coming in. The amounts show the, the generosity of the public, uh, CIF and PCPA and a variety of other places in providing grants, and, and that's great. But what I find startling about this is the difference between the year-to-date receipts number and the estimated receipts number. And most of the estimated receipts numbers, at least on page three, were zero. And I think it's just something that we, whoever's next year's finance chair, might want to focus on, uh, it looks as though when you look and see the the difference, it's a 312% difference. Now, a chunk of that is the stimulus funds, so, you know, you look at that. But there's about a half million dollars of stuff that wasn't budgeted for, and I don't know if it just wasn't, I just looked at this right before this meeting, I don't know if it was not budgeted for in the the school budget, or if it was just never entered on this form, you know, the estimated receipts numbers. I, don't, I can't remember if they put in estimated receipts on the budget. But given that it's a half million dollars, it seems to me that we might want to um, request the school department to, if indeed there are estimates, to enter them on this form so they can be followed. And if they aren't making estimates, it might be handy to have some estimates, because we're talking some real money here, half a million dollars. But if I might, perhaps there's something I'm misunderstanding. Yeah, that, so. that was a prior discussion. I don't know if it was this year's finance committee or the, the last year's finance committee, but I think it really applied to last year. The city of Portland got into tremendous trouble when they budgeted Medicaid funds mm -hmm. incorrectly that, that didn't come in. And so Cape Elizabeth the School Board has always taken the position never to budget those funds. And, you know, you specifically asked, well, what are they going to be spent on? You know you're going to get so much. And they actually gave you a list of, uh, in, I think maybe it was this year for the first time, specifically on how those funds are due to be spent. I can, yes, we, we can but, track it back. And, and that's in the budget process, but I think for the purpose of everybody knowing what's actually showing up and coming in, e even with the Medicare and the stimulus funds backed out, it's like three hundred, four hundred thousand dollars $400,000. So my request just as a counselor, not as the finance chair, but whoever's next year's chair, if we could perhaps see, I don't know if this is a thing that Pauline does or whatever, if we could plug in those, those estimates for the revenue, because there's a lot of revenue that's coming in that isn't being estimated for. It, it appears. Yes. If I might, you know, in order to have estimated receipts, Mm -hmm. Those need to be adopted as estimated receipts as part of the budget process. Mm -hmm. We can't unilaterally go in and put estimated receipts. No, of course not. Uh, so, you know, if I, I would agree if that ought to be recalled to be part of next year's budget process. Yeah, because we're not ta I'm not talking if, if it were a few hundred dollars here or there or even a few thousand dollars here or there, I'd think, well, you know, you don't know. But we're getting up into hundreds of thousands of dollars here. So it's just a record-keeping thing so that everybody knows where the money's coming in and where the money's going out. And I think of this because of what happened in Portland. If we, it just for the sake of the public being able to see what's coming in and what's going out. Um, it seems to me we have some sort of fiduciary duty to request that this data be available before the end of the year. So that's it. Thanks, Anne. Um, Dave. Um, if I may, very briefly, um, and I'm sorry there aren't more people here, and I hope there's somebody watching at home for this comment, because the comment is directed to whoever might be watching and to our town manager. Um, but the town manager, in giving us the synopsis of where we stand as of year end, um, sort of gave credit to the council for anticipating the downturn and not having to scramble like other communities did. And I think in all fairness, um, the lion's share, if not all of the credit, uh, belongs with the town manager uh, for anticipating this, warning us, and being proactive in finding ways 
to cut the budget, to cut the expenses, to match the anticipated decline in revenues, to make sure that we would end up exactly where we ended up. Um, there wasn't much creativity on the part of the council in coming to this number, but there was a lot of creativity on the part of the town manager, and I just wanted to recognize that. Yeah. I, I appreciate well, that, but you know, the council last year, in order to reach this budget process, lowered the revenue estimates. You know, you, and other councilors might have seen it as well. You know, you, you did it, and last year, one of the reasons why we needed to have such fiscal discipline this year was that when you did that last year, the municipal little section increased 10% net to taxes. That clearly wasn't sustainable, and you were willing to do that for one year, sort of, you know, I think with, a, with an understanding that, you know, we needed to find some things to do to otherwise get down. And I think it was a, it, it ended up was a nice two-year plan by the council. So in essence, we're re, what, we, what we've done is we've, re, we've reverted the budget to what it was two years ago, and in the second year we sort of wiped out the increase the first year, but most other councilors wouldn't have been willing to, willing to do that. I stand by my comment. <laughs> I stand by David's comments, too. Uh, we do have to clean up uh, item 116-2009. Um, town manager has recommended that the town council authorize certain balances to be carried forward into the fiscal year beginning July 1, 2009. Do I hear a motion? So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. Discussion on the motion? All in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. And now we move on to item 117-2009, which was alluded to by the manager in his comments on the budget, uh, proposed municipal operations review committee. Um, the town council has discussed the potential for establishing the committee, and uh, I agree with comments that Ann made. Uh, you know, at this point, we don't know what to expect. Uh, but I do think from a business perspective and from a business owner's perspective, it does uh, make a great deal of sense to check in every once in a while with an objective eye to see how we're doing things, if we're doing things as well as we are, as, as well as we should. So uh, I would entertain a motion, if there is one. David? I would move that we uh, establish a committee to review municipal operations uh, in accordance with the draft charge that we were provided with for tonight's meeting. Second. Moved and seconded. Uh, discussion on the motion. I, I uh, Sarah? read this with great interest and thought it's already been done. I mean, <laughs> when you read their conclusions, it's like, okay, that pretty much still applies. I mean, a lot of them you can check off and say they've been done, and some of them haven't, and maybe that's where you... In other words, I'm not diminishing the value of it, but I'm wondering about the necessity. Yeah, it was interesting to note that many of the same issues... Exactly the same. And, and many of them have been done, and a few hadn't. I was like, okay, the few that hadn't, maybe that's where we focus on looking at it. I mean, it was quite interesting, I thought, to see the parallels. So I just guess wonder if we need a year-long committee with a lot of work and a lot of Mike's time to come up with something that probably will be read fairly similar to this, uh, particularly now that we have the benefits committee, okay. just to be devil's advocate. Mm -hmm. Other discussion, comments? David? I, I mean, I certainly echo the comments that both Ann and Sarah have made, as well as our town manager. I, I do think there is some value in reviewing how we do things. I would not anticipate, if I were on this committee, that I would go through every single last department, but I might be willing to explore some of the ideas that we, we keep getting thrown at us. And it may be, after a year's worth of work, the committee is going to come back and say, uh, we're efficient and, and uh, we don't want to see a change in the services we provide or how we provide them. But that, that in, a, in and of itself, might be a useful exercise. Um, so I'd be willing to, to have a committee go forward and do this. Thank you. Penny? I would, I would agree with um, David Sherman because I think that um, we've heard comments from citizens. Um, I'm, you probably have over the last several years. It's time that uh, let's let people come forward who have 
ideas and feel as though they're participating. And um, if we discover some things, which I assume we will through the process, then it's just additional benefits. So. Yeah. I just wanted to ask a question. Mike, are you the staff person for this committee? Do you, or, I mean, I know there will be other. Uh, I'm an ex officio um, non voting member of the committee. I anticipate being the coordinator of the staff response. Right. To all the different information requests that come forward. Okay. And how much of your time, I, and I know this may be hard for you to estimate, but how much of your time do you think this will take? I think uh, at times it will take lots of time, uh, but it's, it's what managers do. Mm -hmm. okay. I would just say I, I echo David Backer's and others' remarks and Sarah's remarks that I think a lot of these things have been done, but I do think that, um, you know, times change, the citizen returns over, the council turns over, and I don't think it's a bad thing to do this, but I, I won't reiterate all my previous comments, but I would caution everyone, uh, the committee members as well as the public at large, to not expect amazing savings to be found because I'm, and without making some radical change to what services are provided by municipal government. Um, and I, I do have somewhat of a concern um, in that this will take a fair amount of time from town staff and the town staff is being asked to do more with fewer people. And so that is a concern. It does, it is outweighed, I think, by the, uh, the public's uh, request to be doing it. So I, I will be supporting it, but I do have some reservations about uh, every time you study something, it takes a lot of time of staff and they are being asked to do more and more and more with fewer and fewer people. So we have heard from some members of the public who think that certain employees, all they do is serve on committees and that there's really no need for those committees and yet this is another committee. So it's sort of a circular kind of argument. So, but I will be supporting it. Thanks, other comments? Seeing none, all in favor of the motion. Unanimous, thank you. Um, According to the charge, uh, it's up to me to select uh, two town councilors to uh, serve on the committee. Uh, I won't do that in the meeting tonight, but I will be in touch. So. Oh, and if I could just add, I know we've just voted, but if I could add one more comment. I, I think people should also be aware, citizens who might not be aware that 60, 65 percent of the town, the overall town's budget is the school department, and this will not be, as I understand it, looking at the school department. So perhaps the school department will set up their own committee to do these things, but this will not, this will be covering municipal operations only, not the school operations. So people who have suggestions or whatever about school operations need to go to the school department, to the uh, uh, school board, if they have thoughts about what they want to have done about the schools. Thanks, Ann. Good point. Um, before we adjourn to executive session uh, to consider a, a request for a property tax abatement, I will offer citizens another chance to speak, but they're not here, so. I just say uh, one thing in public. The Ralph Gould Award for Community Service uh, up there, that plaque, uh, it wasn't presented in 2008, uh, and the council ought to be thinking of, you know, potential citizens for that. And I just mentioned it that maybe you, you, you might like to encourage citizens to give you some suggestions as well. Very good. Uh, the Ralph Gould Award exemplifies uh, citizenship problem more than anything else, contributions to the community, uh, selflessness, and uh, people that uh, generally are out there representing what is good about Cape Elizabeth. So if the public could uh, give that some thought, David. Uh, this is a question for the town manager. Could there be an update on the town website uh, asking for yeah, we'll do that. Uh, suggestions? Good idea, David. Coming from a member of our communications review <laughs> committee. <laughs>
Um, upcoming meetings, uh, our next town council meeting is scheduled for August 10th, 2009. As I mentioned earlier tonight, uh, that may include consideration of the town center intersection or we may be calling a special meeting depending on the pleasure of the council. Uh, August 20th, we have an employee recognition luncheon at Fort Williams Park. Uh, September 3rd is the town council workshop uh, at which we will discuss the library report. And uh, September 14 is the date of our September town council meeting. Um, if there are no other items to discuss, I would entertain a motion to adjourn to. Yeah, I just uh, want to say something on that lunch for. That was cut out of the budget. We're, we're trying to do it very low cost, and the employees are going to be doing the cooking, and we're just trying to find a way to do it far less expensively. So, in case someone wonders why we're still doing it. David? I was actually I didn't hear a word Mike said, but I wanted to ask, I, I another, I wanted to to ask another question. I'm sorry, what was the yeah, question? I, I was just saying the employee the recognition lunch. luncheon. You had you had indicated some concern. We were eliminating it, yeah. and we heard that concern. And what we're just trying to do it very low cost. Burgers. No, we used to go to Propudic, and they served. We're doing it much lower cost. The employees are going to do the cooking themselves, and it's going to be a team, uh, community, community uh -huh. effort of the employees. So. And he said, "Would you please luck? bring all the groceries?" Oh, excellent! Yeah, no, no problem. Know. David's bringing all the groceries. <laughs> that, did you have an? I, I just. I, I'm wondering where the shore road pathway is fitting into our agendas because uh, I, I know we had had some discussion about a possible framer for our discussion, but I didn't mm. know when that was going to come up because there's obviously been a lot of interest about that issue. Mike and I had talked about it, and uh, the thinking that I that I have, and and some of the comments that I've heard in the community are that we don't want to be holding a mess of public hearings in the summertime because a lot of people that would like to speak are not available. So we're thinking September-ish, I think. Or, okay. Now, I, I, I've had a lot of people asking me, what about the shore road pathway? But uh, I've also heard, well, don't do anything this summer because people are everywhere and they don't want to miss an opportunity to speak. So. <laughs> yeah, I, I, just on the timing, I would like to see if, if, if we're going to have a vote to move it forward or not that this occur before the elections in November. <laughs> I think it'd just be nice if this council, since I mean I haven't been on that long, but this council has been struggling with the issue more so than obviously the next one would be. And it seems to me to be logical that would have a vote. That would before. be my hope. Okay. That would be my hope. So would it be in August we'd set the um, public hearing for September? If that's the pleasure, yeah, that's that's what I'd like to see. That would make sense. Yeah. Okay. I agree with David that if we somehow waited to have a council vote until after November, I mean, it means sort of re-educating a mm -hmm. whole new group of counselors. And mm -hmm. Sometimes after one particular group's done all the prep work and reports and workshops and stuff, it's a lot easier for that group to decide if there are decisions to be made. Good. I saw a lot of nods on that, so I think we'll go with that. Um, so I'd entertain a motion to adjourn to executive session, and we won't be returning after the executive session. Except to take a vote. Except to take a vote on what we discussed. But not discussed. on camera. Yeah, not on camera. So moved. Okay. Second. Moved and seconded. Discussion. All in favor? I think the motion needs to reference oh. the specific okay. section of the staff uh, that, that we're using to enter executive session. The minutes will reflect that. Okay, the minutes will reflect that. <laughs> That was a 6-0 vote, I think. Yep. Okay, very good. Thank you very much.